I've actually misled you a little bit today with our sermon title, Shepherds Keeping Watch. It's really not about the shepherds that were at the manger, but it's the shepherds of a local church, a group of people called the elders. We're wrapping up this series we've been on through 1 Peter. This is message number 11. So we've been in it almost three months. And Peter wrote this letter to a group of believers who had come into the family of God, not from Jewish backgrounds, and yet they were under severe persecution and trials. And so uh, I figured this is a great um, analogy for us as we're going through the trials of 2020 to learn some of the lessons that they've learned. And Peter reminded them that they're exiles on this earth, that you're traveling through, that your ultimate home is in another place. He told them how to live their lives, that as part of the family of God, they're to live and let their witness show, not just with their words, but even more so by their actions, so that it removes any argument people may have against your faith and against your God. He says that one of the main ways that um, demonstrates in, your, in a Christian's life is how you submit to authority. See, many people rebel and speak ill um, and challenge authority figures in their life, from their parents to their bosses to their um, governors to their kings and presidents. And the Bible says that we're to be different. We're to be subject and to honor those that God will hold accountable for their leadership over us. We've learned that as believers, we're to invest our energies into praying, loving, and serving. But today's going to be a different kind of a message because it really focuses on a special group of people within the church family called the elders. Uh, most of you will never be an elder. Many of you probably wonder, what in the world is an elder? And many people who come to this church will ask, what kind of church are you? Who actually governs this church? Well, you're going to learn today a lot about a group of people in our church called the elders. And that's what Peter focuses on. But it's not just a message about elders and for elders. It's a message for us to know how to support our elders, how to pray for our elders, how to empathize with what our elders do for this church. And I believe that by the time you leave here, you're going you're gonna to appreciate God's unique design in putting elders over the local church. So 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 1, just read the first five verses. Peter says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to your elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what can we learn about elders? What do we need to know from this passage? Well, three main truths jump out from this passage. Number one, elders provide oversight for the church. Now, Paul was another apostle like Peter, but Paul had a special message, message to preach to the Gentiles, people that didn't grow up knowing about God, and to lead them to faith in Christ. And he went all over um, that area, the, the Asia Minor and around Israel and the surrounding areas, preaching to those that didn't know Christ. And as groups of believers formed, they created churches. And these churches, over time, would meet together, maybe similarly than we, but probably not in buildings like this and chairs and worship bands and all that, but they would meet together on a regular basis for fellowship. And over the course of time, the apostles had to leave to go to another place. So they would entrust that local church to a group of leaders they would call elders, elders. This was Paul's practice. He even tells Timothy and Titus that they should do this. Now, an example of Paul in the book of Acts, this was his normal practice, chapter 14, verse 23. It says, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So that was standard practice. Let's get a church going. Let's put elders in place. Let's move on to the next location. Now, this was so important that they devoted time to prayer and fasting. When something's real serious, when there's something you really feel burdened about, where you really want God's involvement in, you fast and you pray. And this was something that was very important, prayer and fasting. Because a bad appointment, a, a bad gentleman to become an elder could be disastrous for a church. It could ruin a church. So you had to be very cautious about who was placed. Now, two words are used, and I want to explain them because they, they have some application uh, in church governance. The Greek words are presbyteros 
and episkopos. Presbyteros refers to an older person. It's translated elder. It, mean, it means an older or mature person. When my eyes have gotten worse over time, they develop a condition called presbyopia, which means my eyes are getting older. They're, they're not as flexible as they used to be. My eyes have aged. And a, pres, a Presbyterian person, that's a whole denomination of a church, but a presbyteros or an elder is someone who's not just old age-wise, but mature, mature. Let me emphasize the word maturity. Sometimes a younger person may exhibit great maturity, be, be well beyond their years. My grandfather, who was old, would never be qualified to be an elder. I remember he used to gather in a little shack behind his house with his buddies. They'd play poker. They'd smoke their cigars and drink their beer. Now, if, I, if you put that group of men in charge of a church, it'd be disastrous. Are they, are they old? Yes, but they're not qualified. You want age plus maturity because that equals wisdom. That's what you want. Life wisdom. Another word is um, episkopos, which means to, to be over. That's the word epi. And then scope is to see, to see over, to oversee. These are called overseers. Some Bibles say bishops. An elder is a man. Well, let me back up there. The presbyteros is a mature man with seasoned judgment. And episkopos is, a, is an elder who is charged to see that ministry is done properly, to oversee it, to see the big picture and know how the parts all fit together. In fact, one of the qualifications for an elder is they manage their household well. Why is that? Because God says, if you can't manage your own home, you can't manage the four people in your house, you're the six people in your house, there's no way I'm putting you in charge of my people at the church. Because there's many comparisons. Even beyond the home, you know, you've got buildings and you've got, you've got budgets and strategies and staff and programs and all this stuff to to tie together so it works in harmony. And we want people who see the big picture or who have vision. There was a, a blind man that was flying an airplane and his layover was in Sacramento. He was waiting for his connecting flight. And when they landed in Sacramento, all the other passengers got up and he just decided he was gonna wait there. And he asked though, when the stewardess asked if he needed anything, said, well, it would be really nice if someone could take my dog for a walk. He had a seeing eye dog with him. So the pilot says, I'd love to do that. So the pilot reached over, took the leash, and before he exited the plane, leaned into the cockpit and grabbed his sunglasses and put them on. Then he went walking out in the lobby with the dog. <laughs> and the passengers waiting to catch the next flight looked at the pilot with his sunglasses and his seeing eye dog and said, I think we're going to get a, a ticket on another plane. <laughs> because we want to make sure that the one flying our plane can see and people want to know that the people leading the church can see, that they see into the future. They, they see all that's happening. They're not blind. They're not ostriches who've put their heads in the sand. Elders are people who have vision. Now, notice just a few little things in here. He says, these are over you. They're overseeing you, but they're among you, meaning they're from you. They're from your midst. They don't, they don't, you don't import them. You don't look out there to get elders to come to your church. And elders don't occupy an office miles away. They're right here among you. Notice also that it's, it's plural, men, not a man. It's men. It takes more than one elder. Now, it could be two, could be seven. Some have had many as 15 to 20 elders in the church. But it's a plurality because it can't be a one-man show. You don't want to put a person in a position of abusing that. And the plurality of the teamwork of eldership helps to give balance to it. Also, when Peter describes these roles of a, of a mature person and overseer, he uses the word man. Now, I know some churches have, have women elders. We don't in our church, and there's a reason for that. Uh, we believe, much like the family, that God has given men a, a responsibility to oversee things. doesn't mean they're wiser than the women. In fact, many women are wiser than the men. doesn't mean they're more talented or gifted than the women, because many women are more gifted than their husbands. It's not a matter of ability. It's a matter of responsibility. And God says, you men, step up. Be leaders in your home, be leaders in your church. And you lead by being Christ-like. It's not a position of power. It's not a position of, of exerting harsh authority. It's humble service of taking the lead, of seeking God in the midst of all that. Now, I know sometimes, like in the family, where, the, where no man is present in particular, there's a lot of single, single parent homes where a, a, a mom has to take on that role of being the leader of that household. Similarly in churches, there are churches where men don't step up 
Men aren't available. Men aren't mature enough. And women have to fill those roles. But I'm just saying, ideally, God designed it that a man would step into that role. Now, you can already tell by those words that I use, presbyteros and episkopos. They're two denominations of churches that actually have, have adopted those words as part of their name because it's the form of their church government. It's an it's a elder formed government, Presbyterian church and the Episcopal church. They're just, just led differently, but by a group of elders. In the Episcopal church, they're called bishops. In the Presbyterian church, they're called presbyters. But they're all the same kind of thing. Bishops, pastors, elders, presbyters, they can often refer to the very same thing. And Peter and Paul didn't invent this. This is actually rooted way back in the Old Testament. When Moses was called to challenge Pharaoh, he was told, go talk to the elders of Israel. Well, these were mature leaders within the different tribes of Israel, the representative leaders, mature people that, the, that the, their own tribes looked up to, said, you represent us. And so Moses would communicate God's truth to that group of leaders. And all through the Old Testament, we, fe- we find that God relied on these leaders within the tribes to exert some, some good leadership, but they often failed. In fact, the, the prophets rebuked them sometimes for the way they failed to lead God's people. In fact, read in the book of Ezekiel where it says the shepherds failed to bind up their wounds and to feed them and to search for them when they strayed. In the book of Jeremiah, God says this, God says this about the shepherds. For the shepherds are stupid and do not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, they have not prospered and all their flock is scattered. Now, I give a little bit of grace to these leaders back then because they didn't have Bibles. They didn't have Bibles like this to follow. They had, they had no written scriptures to carry around with them, and they did not have the presence of the Holy Spirit within them. So it was harder back then, but that makes them even more needful of wisdom from God. But, but God says, you didn't inquire of me. You didn't come asking me for help. You didn't seek wisdom from me, and you should have. But God says there's a better day coming when this is all going to change. Also in the book of Jeremiah, he says, and I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. There's coming a time, and I believe he's speaking of the New Testament age, where I will give you shepherds who follow me, who are like Jesus to you. They will know my heart and extend it to you. When the gospel of Jesus was then preached in the New Testament, churches were formed, elders were chosen to be boots on the ground leaders. These were ordinary men within the congregation, who met certain qualifications. Now, you can read in the Bible, and I won't pull up those verses, but you can read in Acts chapter 6 of how they picked church leaders and how Paul gave lists to both Timothy and Titus and then what Peter says here about elders. But we can kind of lump all these qualifications together in, in about four categories. If you're looking for qualified people to become elders, here are the four categories of qualifications. They live an exemplary life and display tested, mature character. They exhibit healthy leadership in their marriage and family. Like I said, if they can't lead their own home, they have no business leading in the church. Um, They have a knowledge of the scriptures and ability to instruct others, and they are known to be full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. I mean, you can just tell this person is wise and that God is working through them. When these things are evident in a person's life, people naturally go to them. And when people go to an elder like that, You say, you know, that person ought to be an elder. You don't gain these after you become an elder. These are qualifications actually to become an elder. Now, I want to introduce you to the elders of our church because many of you probably don't even know. We have seven elders in our church. And Tom Downing is chairman of our elders. Uh, Mark Fisher is the vice chairman. Dan Casson, incognito there, he's the blind man. No, he's just, he's out, he's out fishing. Um, Dan is the secretary, which means he has the, the, the dirty work of recording all the minutes from our meetings. And then we have Barry Dodson, Scott Price, who you just saw a few m- moments ago, uh, Wayne Hinkle, and myself, seven elders. Now, you might, you might ask, well, how come you're an elder? You know, some churches have elders, and then they have the senior pastor over here, and they're always kind of at odds with each other. There's like a power struggle. And the elders are always trying to keep their senior pastor in line. The senior pastor is bad-mouthing the elders because he doesn't like them, but he has to work with them anyway. And we don't have that kind of relationship here. We're a team. We work together. Ever since I've been here at this church, the elders have always sought to have a good relationship with their senior pastor and work together as a team. Now, I would tell you this, that the elders exhibit oversight of my ministry. I'm their one employee they manage. 
And they hold me accountable for the staff and what we do as a staff. Um, So they're over me in the sense of I'm the elder's employee. I am an elder, so I'm an equal with them. Then Then I'm also their pastor. When they have pastoral needs, I'm there for them. So I serve kind of three different hats in my relationship with the elders. But God has blessed it, and it has worked really well. There's a real danger in a church where the senior pastor sees himself as over the elders. And that can happen at a church where a man plants a church, that church grows, people love that pastor, he gets a great following, and then he picks elders from among the church who feel a little timid in challenging him. After all, he's the founding pastor. Everybody loves him. What do we have to say about him? And so they, they, they don't hold him accountable. And many senior pastors who planted churches have actually gone astray and abused their role. Maybe they've been harsh. Maybe they've gotten into financial messes. Maybe they got into um, sexual misconduct. But nobody held them accountable. It's not a healthy, healthy place. I would just tell you there are elders uh, are over me as as. As, as their job of oversight and make sure that we stay on track. And I would also say this, nothing happens in this church that's major without their knowledge or approval. So any changes in, in times of service or budgets or you know, big things that move in this church, they know about it and we don't move unless they approve it. So I wanna give you the assurance of that. Pikes Peak Christian Church is a church that is owned by Jesus Christ overseen by elders, directed by staff, and fueled by each of you, the congregation. And we all work to lead God's church here, just in different functions. Elders are called to oversee the church. Secondly, they're called to shepherd the flock. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. You know, there's, there's over 500 references in Scripture of either shepherds or shepherding, the profession of shepherding. I really believe it is the oldest profession. It's in Scripture. Uh, Anywhere in the Middle East where you'd go for centuries, you'd find shepherds leading their flocks to to new pastures. Now, we don't see them today. Now, I grew up in Wisconsin, and we could see cows on farms all over the place, but, but never sheep. And you probably don't drive around the area and say, hey, there's a shepherd out there leading his sheep. We're just, it's just not our culture. It's, it's changed. See, back then, shepherding was a major profession because sheep provided milk for cheese. They provided wool for clothing. Um, they provided sometimes meat, though you'd really, it had to be a special occasion to sacrifice a, a lamb because it couldn't produce the other things that you needed. And if you were Jewish, of course, you needed lambs for your sacrifices. And so it was just very prevalent in their culture. We might want to change it and say like, well, maybe there's something today that would fit better. Maybe, maybe we should call elders like spiritual fathers. I mean, that's a good term, right? They provide care, they're, they're fathering. Uh, but it's bigger than that. It doesn't really capture the breadth of responsibilities. And oftentimes people have a, a bad image of their father. So you call your church elders fathers, they go, well, my father was never there for me. My father didn't provide for me or care for me. I don't like to call my elders fathers. Uh, how about business leaders? Because there's business elements to church, right? You got, you got buildings and budgets and strategic thinking and all that kind of stuff that goes at businesses. And we can learn a lot from business, but I don't know anybody who says, I want my church to be run like a business because we're a family. How about teachers? How about if our elders are just called teachers? Teaching's a great profession. I mean, teachers that we know from school are relational and they're educational. And they're working with kids to to stress them. And we could look at our elders that way. And that is a function of our elders, but it doesn't cover all that they do. So rather than try to find a replacement for this image, I I, want to say maybe we'd be better off to understand why God chose this metaphor and what does it look like for us if we're functioning like shepherds. Now I would tell you this, a shepherd is a fitting picture of of the type of leadership God desires within his church. But there's another reason for it. It's because sheep are a fitting metaphor for the people in the congregation. That's what's driving this imagery, not so much the shepherds, but the sheep. Think about it. Of of all the animals God could choose that that represent us, you know, horses, you know, elephants, dogs, you know, something like that. No, sheep, bumbling, wandering, slow-thinking, stubborn sheep. Very fitting for people from God's perspective. We all like sheep. 
gone astray, the scripture says. Do you know that a sheep can actually roll on its back and it's called cast? When When a sheep is cast, Sometimes they're helpless to roll back over. It's because they're so thick with their um, fleece, they cannot roll over. It, it's a hilarious sight, actually, to see a sheep on its back and its little legs going like this, and it can't roll over. Why? He needs a shepherd to roll it back over. You know, shepherds wander off and get stuck in the crevices, and a, and a shepherd has to come over with his staff and pull them out. You don't, you don't hear of horse herders, right? Horse, you know, how about cow herders? You go out in the farm and see the cow herder out? No. But, but you won't find sheep without a shepherd. They depend on the shepherd. They need to be led. And so do people. To be honest, I would say if we really think about it, we want, we want to be led because we don't know enough. Don't you want a government with good leaders? You and I don't, don't know enough to fill those positions, but we want a governor and a mayor and a president and all those that fill those positions to be good, godly people. We need leadership. If, you have, if you're part of a business, don't you want the board and the president and the CEOs and all those officers to be really good at what they do in leadership? Yes. If you're part of a sports team, don't you want the management of the team to be strong? Absolutely. If you're in a family, don't you want your parents to know what they're doing? Absolutely. We want leadership. We want good leaders within our lives. Now, we have a lot of animals in my neighborhood. We've had raccoons, deer, antelope, prairie dogs by the gangbusters. I mean, we've got all kinds of creatures around. None of them depend on human being to lead them. But sheep, yes, they, they need help. We face great challenges. I mean, just think of 2020. Haven't we been crying out for leadership? Haven't we been crying, please help us navigate through this because we don't know what to do. Because we're looking for people above us, whether it be in our church. Should our church open or close? Should the school stay open or should it close? The government, should we do this or, or should we do that? We're looking for leaders up here who see the bigger picture to navigate us through it. That's what we really want because we're sheep and we need help and there's, there's no shame in that. And all through the Old Testament, God has always looked to shepherds as the model. He called the elders of Israel. He called them shepherds. The prophets, the priests, the kings were called to shepherd. And above all, God himself, if he, if he could pick any profession of all, he says, I am your shepherd. David said it, the Lord, 23rd Psalm. The Lord's my financial manager. You know, the Lord's my daycare provider. No, he says, the Lord is my what? Shepherd. The Lord is my, even David. David, had, David was a shepherd boy, but David knew that he needed a shepherd over him, and he was king. And you and I need a shepherd over us. So this image of shepherd tells us a lot about our approach or the elder's approach. Peter says, I write to you as a feller, fellow elder. It's very likely that, that Peter was an elder in the church of Jerusalem that actually functioned on the, the leadership team of that congregation. And we know that after Jesus rose from the dead, remember that Peter denied Jesus three times? And after the, the crucifixion, Peter went out fishing with his buddies, but then Jesus rose from the dead, shows up on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias, and then Peter encounters Jesus one more time. And they have this great um, interaction on the, the beach. And while they're there on the shore, Jesus tells him some things. And among what Jesus says to him, he says this to Peter. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon and Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Oh, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, I know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep, tend my sheep. Peter, if you love me, take care of my kids. Take care of my family. That's how you're going to show your love to me. And, and those really explain the two functions of an elder and how they shepherd. One is through the feeding, which is more than physical food. It's speaking of spiritual food. You know, the scripture says, man does not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need spiritual food. The elders feed the flock through truthful teaching, through truthful teaching. It's one of the most important functions of an elder, to understand scripture and to communicate that through various 
ways of communication. It could be preaching, it could be teaching a class, leading a small group, it could be uh, mentoring one-on-one. It's teaching. That's why one of the requirements to be an elder is they've got to be able to teach. They don't have to have preaching skills, but they have to know the Word and know how to communicate it to others. You know, I would say for most of us, this is true for me, but I'm sure it's true for a lot of you. When I came to know the Lord, I got less and less interested in what other people had to say, and I really wanted to know what God had to say. And I'm less interested in hearing what's on the news and what all the talking heads and radio personalities have to say about an issue as much as I really want to know what does God say about that issue. And when people come to church or come to a Bible class or come to a small group, they're really hungry for that. They don't want to rehash what was on CNN the other night or what was on Fox News or what Sean Hannity had to say. We're really hungry for what does God have to say about this. And our leaders need to know God's word very well. When Paul was at um, Ephesus, he established a church. He stayed there three years, really, really discipling that body of believers. He grew to know those um, elders real well. And so later on in his life, when he knew that he probably was going to get executed soon, he was on a ship passing near Ephesus, and he sent word that he wanted to meet with those elders. And he met them on the beach, gave them this very beautiful speech that's recorded in Acts chapter 20. And toward the end of that speech, Paul says this to those elders. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. What he was referring to is false teachers are going to come up, and they're, they're even going to arise from within your own church. And they're going to sound good, but they're going to be a little off base and lead people astray. And that's why it's so critical that we know the basics of Scripture. What do we believe? And, 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 and have our ears tuned to things that are false to say, hey, that doesn't sound right. I don't think that's what the Bible says. And that's why we have, you know, beliefs for our church or, or sometimes position papers on certain issues because there are people out there who will take some Bible verses, every cult, knows how to take Bible verses and use to their advantage. And they'll lead people astray into their beliefs because we don't know the word well. Get to know the word. In fact, I would say if you ever go to another church, go visit another church, make sure they have a high view of Scripture and teach God's word because it'll protect us from that. Truthful teaching, feed the flock. Secondly, he says tend the flock. So I describe that as tender tending, to be gentle. We don't drive our sheep like cattle. You know, if you're a rancher, you're trying to get the cattle to move to a new pasture, you know, you, you get on your horse and you might crack a whip, but you drive those cattle to the next place and, you know, they get spooked and they run. You don't drive sheep from the back. You lead them from the front. You lead them by example. You want them to follow you. And you provide tender care for them. It says in Isaiah chapter 40, this is how God shepherds us. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. He will carry them where? In his bosom, in his heart. They're not just a name on a list. They're, they're, they, they've lodged into their heart. The shepherd loves those sheep almost like his own kids. An elder loves a congregation almost as dear as his own children, cares for them, tends to them, knows them. In fact, you can't, you can't know the needs of your sheep if you're not among them. Shepherds get dirty, and biblical shepherds lay down at night to protect their sheep. Um, one of our elders, Barry Dodson, gave me a book it's by a guy named Lynn Anderson. The title of the book is They Smell Like Sheep. It's a book for elders. They smell like sheep. I love that because a good elder lives among the people, and identifies with what the people are going through. They do, over time, smell like sheep. And many of you have gotten close to the elders. They've visited you in the hospital. They've taught your small group. They, they've brought you food when you've been in need. They've counseled you um, in a personal issue. They've listened to your complaints about the church. They've helped you when your marriage was on the rocks. You come forward and they prayed with you. They gave you financial support or a food basket. Now, our elders are there because they love the flock and they provide tender tending. Now, as you saw before, there's seven elders. And I would say that our church um, 
family consists of, a, of over 2,000 people. Can seven shepherds take care of seven or 2,000 people? No. There are many people we don't know by name, we don't know their needs, and that's why we need the, actually the whole church in some ways to function like shepherds. See, this goal of being a shepherd isn't for someone who aspires just to be an elder. This is what it means to be Christ-like, to be like Jesus. And that applies to people of all ages and both men and women. We should all aspire to care for people like God cares for us. And so if you are a parent, shepherd your family. If you're, if you're a small group leader for the little ones or for big ones, you know, adults, be a shepherd to that group. If you lead a ministry, shepherd that. If you lead a department, shepherd that. Function like a shepherd. Now, Peter also talks about the attitude of an elder and that they should be willing and selfless servants who lead by example. He says, first, they serve willingly, not under compulsion. Their arms not twisted. They're not simply filling a slot on the board. See, many men would love to have a title, love to, to be branded as an elder of their church. But he says that, that they have to be willing to serve, but they have to be selfless. It's not about them. It's about the people. Several years ago, I had a, a gentleman come to me, and he sat in my office, and he was a very devoted volunteer in this church. He said, Darren, he says, I've done everything in a church. You know, I've, I've taught classes for all ages. I've sung on the worship team. I've done technical stuff. I've done pretty much everything except for two things, preach a sermon and be an elder. And I'd love to do both of those. And this guy's a pretty blunt guy. I mean, he just, he just always talks very bluntly, and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to be blunt with him. <laughs> I said... I said, sir, I said, I just have to be honest with you. You're never going to preach a sermon in this church, and I doubt if you'll ever be an elder. And here's why. You don't teach anywhere. You don't have a platform that you're using to show that you know God's word well. I'm not about to put you in front of the congregation and give you a Sunday to preach. Secondly, people don't come to you for wisdom. I know you've been in the church a long time. I was in the church since you were a little boy. But people don't seek you out when they're going through struggles or when their marriage is on the rocks or when they have questions. They go to other people. Unless people, until people perceive you as an elder, you'll never be an elder of this church. I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm just saying that's the, that's the reality. An elder needs to be willing, but they need to be more than willing. They need to be selfless. Peter says they need to uh, do it eagerly, not for shameful gain. There's no perks for being an elder. You don't get life, lifetime of free coffee at the coffee bar or a special parking space. You don't, you don't get front row seats in the church. Uh, really, you don't get anything special other than you get to carry the burdens of the congregation. He says, don't be domineering over those you lead, but set an example. Elders lead by knowing the way, going the way, and showing the way. And when they do that well, the sheep want to follow. They want to follow leaders like that. So shepherding is, is both about our approach and our attitude as elders. And then the third thing Peter says in this passage is that they report to the head shepherd, which we all know is Jesus Christ. It's, it's comforting to know that our elders are responsible to someone even above them. See, we are an independent congregation, meaning we don't have an outside board. We don't have um, a, a denominational headquarters that render decisions for this church. Everything is decided by our board. So our, our group of elders come together, but they know, which is why they spend, you know, we spend the first half hour of our meetings in prayer because we need God's help to guide us. We are responsible to him. One day we'll be accountable to him. Peter mentioned this a couple chapters before when he said in chapter two, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus truly is our chief shepherd, elders, are under shepherds, accountable to him. And if we do it well, one day, he says, you'll receive the crown of glory. This crown was typically a laurel wreath stitched out of, out of plants and flowers and placed upon the winner of the games, you know, Olympic games. And so when you competed well, instead of getting a gold medal, you'd get the laurel wreath. But, but here's what Peter says. When you finish this race, when you served well as an elder, you're not going to get... Um, a trophy, and you're not going to get a laurel wreath. You're going to get a crown, get this, that never fades. Never. For the rest of eternity, that crown will never fade. That's your reward.
for humbly serving the Lord and his church. And then the very last thing that Peter says about elders is not to elders, but the rest of us. He says, those who are younger should be subject to them, which means we should honor them, we should support them. And I have to admit, this takes humility because sometimes younger people can say, oh, I know more about the Bible than those guys. I'm smarter than them. I've been studying church books and I've watched other churches and I know how to lead better than they do. What you're lacking is humility and experience. You have knowledge, that's good, but humility and experience. See, Scripture tells us to humbly follow the leadership of God's servants, your elders. And the blessing that comes is he gives grace, not to the proud, but to the humble. You know, this has been a hard year, tough year. There are some churches that, in fact, I was just talking to a guy the other day. Today, they're announcing to their congregation they're letting seven staff members go because their offerings have been down and they can't afford to keep their whole staff. So it's heartbreaking, but they don't see other, any other option. You know, I, I, churches have, have had tough decisions this year of what to do and what not to do, how to navigate through a place we've never been through before. Even, even for me, having gone to seminary, I said, seminary didn't prepare you for pandemics. Nobody ever thought we'd shut churches down or go to online services like this. And yet our elders have faithfully just kept their feet to the fire to guide us through. And we've, we've changed some staff positions. We've, we've created our budgets. We've, in fact, you probably don't even know this. Uh, two months ago, we refinanced our mortgage on this church, on this church building. It went from 45 to 3%, saving us $3,000 a month. I mean, just, just decisions like that how to manage what God has given us, how to be better stewards of what God has provided. Elders work on vision and strategies, and we're in the process of 2021 really looking at what does God have for the next 10 years for us as a church. Leadership exposes yourself to criticism, and not everyone likes the decision that leaders make, but leaders have taken that burden and says, but we will make a decision, right or wrong, we have to lead. We can't be shy, we can't be fearful about making a decision on this issue, even for us being open. I have some friends who are pastors who said, we're just gonna close our church for December. And we decided as a board, but we're not gonna, we don't feel that's right to do. We're gonna stay open for those who want to be here and we're here for you. But um, years ago, there was a lady in a small group and we were sharing a project that the elders had supported, a move the church is wanting to make. And she made this comment just kind of casually. And she was a, a volunteer leader in the church. She said, I bet those elders just sit around thinking up ideas of how to frustrate the congregation. Now I'll tell you, I don't lose my cool very often. But I said, there was something boiling up in me at that moment. I said, you can pick on my preaching. You can dislike things I do. But don't you dare attack these elders. You have no clue what they do. They are volunteers who give willingly of their time to carry the burdens of this church, to carry them before the Lord in prayer, seeking to do what's best and for you to say they're sitting around trying to frustrate the congregation, said, you dare not say that about these men. I know them, and these are good men. And they are. They're good men. They're not perfect, but they're good. And my wife and I, if we look over the 25 years we've been at this church, greatest blessing of being at this church, and we love all of you, but I would say the greatest blessing has been our board, our elders. They've been there to challenge me, to correct me, to encourage me, and to support me. And I'm so grateful that God has put them in my life. And my prayer for you is that you would appreciate them in the same way. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to put the pictures of our elders back up here. I'm going to ask you if you'd stand. And if you're watching online, Pikes Peak Christian Church is your church. I'm going to ask you to stand too. Because this is a significant thing we're going to do right now. We're going to pray for our elders. We're going to pray for their families. We're going to pray that God blesses them for their humble service, their willing service, their tender care for this flock that God has put under their, their care. So would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your marvelous plan. Lord, nobody but you could have thought that a shepherd was a fitting image for the leadership of your people. And Lord, I thank you that over the years you brought many men into this role of elders. Some have already 
passed on. They're wearing their crown of glory already. But many are here serving. And Father, as we talked just the other night, we've got three elders already. Actually, four elders, I think, in their 70s. We're getting older. But Lord, there's a lot of maturity in those years, a lot of wisdom, and I thank you that we can tap into that. But I also pray, Lord, that you'd raise up other men just like them who are examples to the flock, who love their wives, love their kids, who see the big picture, who are humble, willing, who are men of prayer, men of your word. Lord, we thank you for how you use common people among us to then lead in front of us. So Lord, I praise you for these men. I pray for Tom. I pray for Mark. I pray for Dan and Barry and Wayne, Scott. I even pray for myself, for all of us, that we would be rewarded by you with joy from our service. Lord, I know these men aren't asking for a bonus. They're not asking for anything special. But Lord, I would ask that you would fill them and their spouses, their and their families, with joy watching these men lead. So Father, lead us into a great future for this church and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. If you agree, would you shout amen? Amen, amen. 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 God bless you. I will look forward to seeing you next, next Sunday. Take care.